Hi guys, my name is Seb Tudor, I'm the man on the Silver Mountain and welcome back to another Warframe Lore video. This time we're going to continue through the codex entries that we've been, we have been we started going through uh, last week because it turns out that, that getting through these is a little more time consuming than I thought it would initially be. Um, so we need to, to get through from robotics onwards now, uh, so let's get into it. Right, so computing devices, weapons, ship parts, and robotics, the corpus are on the bleeding edge of high technology development. Precise, ma precisely machined metals and flexible synthetic composites are signature to the animalistic robots that the corpus have built as their proxies. Artificial intelligence in these robotics is robust, but intentionally restricted, ensuring a capable but subservient workforce. Now... Again, we know that the the Orokin themselves were careful with their various uh, laws around um, artificial intelligence and stuff like that, which is one of the things that they were concerned about in regards to um, the proto sentience. You know, oh well, if if they adapt and if they grow and if they develop and all the rest of it, then what stops them from becoming intelligent to the extent that they then come back and attack us? Oh, their weakness to the void does. So even if they will never come back and attack the seat of Auric in power, so says Perrin Toll. Um, but you know that turned out not to be the case. But here they've gone. Well, they're just they're, they're, they have kind of problem solving capabilities, but we've restricted it and we've kept them arguably at this animalistic, still communicative. They can communicate, but we've kept them at this animalistic level where they do as they're told. Um, more like virtual assistant levels of of intelligence rather than purely their own ability to learn and develop by themselves. <sighs> Europa. Uh, the icy moon of Jupiter, known as Europa, is the home of the largest sh crash site of the modern war. The scattered remains of a vast corpus obelisk litters the snowy landscape while the battle above wages on. On the otherwise lifeless surface, corpus crew work to recover lost assets, tunneling their way through glacial interior and restoring any and all salvageable items until financial losses are recouped. Now, the first thing that stands out to me here is that Europa seems to have been developed as its own planet on our star chart. It seems to have its own orbit and whatever else. Here, though, it suggests that it's an icy moon of Jupiter, which it is, in reality. Um, but it would be... It wouldn't be, like, a, a, a big thing in my mind to see that the Orokin had moved Europa from, um, from its orbit around Jupiter to being its own individual independent planet in its own orbit. Um... You know, we've seen that they can shift the entire moon, or the technology available to the Orokin was was there to shift the entire moon into the void uh, and back. So, you know, we know that they had huge capabilities, um, but it's it's interesting that the other thing that stands out to me from this one is uh, the Corpus Obelisk. Um, like, I think we see things like it in regards to kind of space stations and things. But I don't like. I would like to have a point where we actually get to go and land on a corpus obelisk proper and have a look around and have a fight on board and all that kind of thing. Um, right, where are we? Corpus, led by the innovatory, innovatory rather, and elusive industrialists, and claiming to be the descendants of Orokin lineage. The corpus are dedicated to the accu ac uh, accumulation of wealth. This elite ruling class operates an insular trade organization using humans and robotics for labor and security, and have condemned uh, have been condemned by the Seven as a merchant cult. So, the 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 corpus see they we whilst I've commented that they don't seem to be hugely Orokin era focused the merchant cult element seems to have been present and you would expect that because of the way the the caste system would work and the way that the 
once the Orokin were gone, whatever leading kind of philosophy, which seems to be the, the mercantile element, would be picked up by the masses as something to hold on to. You know, we see that time and time again as power vacuums are created. Something else always comes in to fill the void that's similar, if, if not very, you know, the same. But claiming to be descendants of Orokin lineage, well, yeah, they're the, the Orokin that went and started to sexually reproduce. Um, it's interesting, again, though, that, that this is placed here because, you know, obviously these are more long-term um, kind of fragments, potentially. But at the same time, a lot of the other stuff that we're talking about is modern day. So who in the Seven would condemn the mer merchant cult? You know, it, it, there seems to be a little bit of dissonance in regards to the way this is written. Uh, you know, if it's a modern thinking of the, the situation, then fine. If it isn't, then what about the other fragments? But hey-ho, this ultimately confirms, though, that the, yes, they, they are biologically, you know, the closest you're going to get to your standard Orokin that was out, out and around. And, you know, they, they we've already seen how they function, but again... There was an element of the belief that they follow this mm, kind of the prophet of prophet thing that Nefanyo here actually uh, kind of throws out into the, into the world. Um, there was an element of that when the Orokin were still around and the Seven didn't like it very much because it was an opposing ideology. The Europa Landscape. Living conditions are harsh on Europa. The surface of Jupiter's moon is flat and desolate. Again, it's called a moon here when it seems not to be. Uh, with a horizon of hard, compacted snow that appears endless. The jagged forms of a crashed corpus obelisk, again the ob obelisk being mentioned, are the only real observable landmarks above the ground. Underground are caverns and tunnels of opaque ice and crystal lakes that may have formed naturally or from residual heat of the crash site. So here we just have a repetition of the, the other two points that I already commented on uh, a moment ago. But again, considering Europa has potentially been moved out of its orbit, depending on what we believe, um, it's interesting to consider that nothing else seems to be on this planet. You've got an awful lot of water, which is incredibly valuable for numerous different reasons. And yet, if if it, if the Orokin went to the the um, effort of moving it from Jupiter's orbit into its own orbit, or if it is still in orbit around Jupiter, then you know it doesn't seem to be represented that way on the star chart, at least from my remembering. Um, right, the void. Originally, we studied void occurrences from afar, observing and catalog cataloging the distribution of galaxies and refine refining cosmological evolution models. We are in a new age of cosmic exploration. Advancements in space travel partnered with determined curiosity have brought us closer to our object of study and with it revelation. So seemingly at one point they became aware of the void but they didn't want to touch it. They sat there, the Orokin, they sat there and they observed it and they, they used it to refine models on how the universe began, whether there was a Big Bang or not or whatever. But now, or at least at the point of, of whoever was writing this wrote this, um, they are partnering their advancements in space travel, i.e. travelling through the void, um, with the kind of capacity to find more out and yet and they say with it revelation it's like what was that revelation or what were those revelations yeah like what did they learn that we haven't been able to to come across just yet the orokin the highly revered orokin civilization built sovereignty uh, built sovereignty on a culture of art technology and architecture to prove oneself worthy of elevated social status, one must face Orokin trials in a gold majestic halls of ascension. At one time, a utopian society of omniscient leadership, the great Orokin era ended in a divine realisation of their own ignorance. Now, were, 
in regards to their their ignorance was this ignorance of what they had done to the Tenno, what they had done to the Warframes, how what they had done to both. Is that a reference to the sentience? Is that a reference to the the collapse as a whole? Which I have some more thoughts on the collapse, which I'll get onto when we get to those um, codex entries. But the thing that stands out here is to prove oneself worthy of elevated social status, i.e., to jump up the ranks of the Orokin from one caste to another. One had to face the Orokin trials in a golden and, and majestic halls of ascension that we see on the moon. Uh, some of which are, would be incredibly deadly to the normal to the average person, and I feel like this is maybe why Orden Karis, what was uh, Ordis before he became a Cephalon, was offered uh, to join the Orokin as one of them, because if he had demonstrated that he could have done the halls, the the trials in the halls of ascension, without you know, actually having to do them, like all the battles he had fought, all the things he had achieved, all them, the stuff that he had done as a mercenary badass, then, you know, they may very well have looked at him and gone, he could have, he could have done every single one of those those tasks already. We, we need to offer this guy the ability to become one of us and grow strong, uh, and uh, have us grow stronger through his inclusion. You know, we need to go do that. Um, so that, that that's an interesting thing to take account of but also considering that us as tenno even potentially as our operators just without our warframes could go and achieve th like the goals through the hall of ascension um like i feel like that's maybe why ballast didn't like us very much because we had all of this power that we could do everything that he could and more and yet we didn't Necessary, you know, we had to go through trauma. You know, we had to lose our families and be stuck in the void on a ship with the dude in the walls for a while, seemingly. But we didn't have to to do possibly any anywhere near what other people had to do. So I feel like that might be a point of contention against us as well. Saturn, uh, the historically well-travelled merchant shipping lanes of Saturn are now dominated by grenier blockades. Heavy military influence populates this area where Grenier commanders believe they have a strategic foothold on travel throughout the system. Under the safeguard of patrolling galleons, the Grenier ceaselessly train their expanding forces, making the region nigh impossible to overtake. So this this is a Grenier stronghold that they've kind of dominated, but at one point it was a kind of nexus of trade activity. So, you know, again, this, this kind of suggests that with the Grenier queens at the top of the, highest, uh, the hierarchy in the Grenier Empire, they've got a really good strategic mind between the two of them. Um, you know, where do you want to control most to ensure that you can't be uh, defeated? Well, you want to control the, the roads, the way that people travel from point A to point B, because if you can ensure that all of those those means of travel are locked down you can't be approached uh, people can't trade and work around you or at least it becomes much much harder to do so so it's it's really interesting again to see that the, the queens have that level of intelligence in what they're, they're doing citizens whilst the, the major warring factions combat each other uh, across the solar system, non-militant organizations and civilian merchants populate the many regional tenor relays. Traveling merchants, uh, merchant collectors that offer rare goods, mentors that offer training and knowledge, uh, and convictional syndicates that preach their own rituals and doctrines. So, here, yes, we've got Barakatir stood here and obviously he is someone that came from one of these other smaller civilizations but we've got like all of those people that work in the kind of blue lotus uh, branded uniforms like where have they come from we've got people like the ostrons the that are completely separate but then we've also like yes mentors that offer training in regards to maybe samaris and in regards to teshin but then in regards to the syndicates, like we know a bit more about New Loka. We know a bit more about the Perrin sequence. We know a bit more about the Red Veil. And we know a bit more about the Steel Meridian. 
and in fact we've 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 learned a reasonable amount about cephalon Suda recently as well but the ones and these are these are my syndicate by the way one of one of the you know i'm cephalon Suda and, and arbiters of hexis more so than anyone else and the arbiters still you know they're the ones that are most invested seemingly in the tenno as their own thing and yet we've not heard any more from them about that just yet which is unfortunate uh to my mind but again like there are We've come also come across, um, as well as the Ostrons, what is the name of the group who, um, with the the child that needed help? It was the Glass Gambit lot, the guys that are, are immune or, like, invisible to the infestation. Can't remember their names. But, like, we've got all of these other small, interesting societies that are around the place that i hope we see much much more of as we get more open worlds as we get more story and other things like finding that ballas has been kept safe secret and worshipped by some of the 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 once devout people of mars would be incredible to see and find out about but that might be wishful thinking on my part right landing craft warframe operative insertion craft come in many designs but they are all commonly classified as short-range stealth aircraft. Fuselage insertion stingers uh, will torpedo the warframe into the hull of a target undetected, and the landing craft will reposition at the extraction point. Between engagements, the landing craft is latched to its sister component, an orbiter. Now, um, when we're in our orbiter, it's fairly safe to say that anything that's above the little... Uh, walkway that lowers down is the Lisette, um or the landing craft and anything below that with the foundry and everything else seems to be the orbiter but um i'm kind of, like i i, I firstly i want to see how that divide happens um you know i'd love to see that from the outside uh but also it would be really it, it's it's interesting to me to think that when we actually get to a place, whenever we land on a, a ship and we just see ourselves falling out of a vent rather than normally where we see ourselves just drop out of, of the ship, here it's telling us that we get fired, you know, insertion stingers will torpedo the warframe into the hull. It's, it's interesting to think that we literally get fired at the ship. So... Um, you know, it's it's interesting to consider, but also hard to visualize because we never see it. So, you know, at some point I'd like to see that be more of a thing. Now, Uranus. Now, this is the, the planet that I'm a, a grand master of, that I was a founder of. So, Uranus has a very special place for me. Unfortunately, the mission that I was a founder of, they changed to be an interception mission. I hate interception missions, so I don't spend as much time on Uranus as I used to. Um, but, submerged deep below Uranus's oceanic surface and hidden from prying eyes is a research facility for cloning and reproduction water pressure at these extreme depths puts massive strain on the glass and steel structures housing these uh these operations but a freshly sprung leak uh, leaks remind of the impending crushing force surrounding them but we forge ahead with their experiments now this is is interesting because uranus in reality is a gas giant and yet, here, it's a water world. And it's a water world that still seems to retain a lot of the storms that we see on Uranus in reality anyway. But it's, but, but it's got normal gravity. And it's, um, we can't really tell if it's got the, the odd tilt to its axis and the weird day-night cycle that... Um, that Uranus has in reality, but again, like the 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 Oricon seem to be able to do all manner of amazing things. In which case, potentially condensing an atmosphere to the extent that, or potentially farming the gas atmosphere of Uranus the same way that the Corpus are doing to Jupiter, to the extent that then they can condense what remains down into a water world, a more comfortable planet. It would still be very interesting, like Umbriel the 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 moon in reality actually traverses at a uh, in a way that causes um, odd interactions with 
the magnetosphere, I believe, of, of Uranus and causes all kinds of weird interference and stuff like that. So that stands out as being interesting. But also you've got this this seems to have been the site of a huge battle because you've got Orokin facilities under under the water, you've got Hunhau down there in the depths, um, as well as all kinds of other ruins of Orokin and sentient kind of design down there. And there's a part of me that wants an open world on Uranus again. And we see lots of stuff the the like we see rocky outcroppings and things like that in the distance from where we are uh, in missions on on Uranus whenever we're able to get above the surface but you know I'm, I want more from this planet because Uranus not just has a special place to me personally but also has um, a very interesting set of things there that are all related and attached to it um, that I, I personally would like to go and explore and find out about. The Orbiter. Tenno operatives are highly mobile strike force, and their property must be equally iterant. Smaller landing craft dock with a, the larger Orbiter shuttle where transient warriors can house their arsenal, foundry, and research systems. Now, again, here we see kind of a concept for it, with the seemingly the set tagged in up here but um it's like this again doesn't seem to match up entirely with what we see and when we see our allies turn up to join us in a group it's just their landing craft there's nothing else attached to it even though they still have access to whatever it is in the orbiter that they can go and, and touch on and I've seen, I wanted to do another video at some point in the future about certain pieces of concept art and what they may suggest um, the, that I've come across. And one of them was for a full-size cruiser for Tenno that might have been different, might have been a different version of the Orbiter, might have been a different version of uh, the Dojo at some point. And I would like to think still something that we see at some point. You know, we've got our own space stations, we've got our own fleet of our landing craft and things like that. I would really like to see us have our own proper large warship type things as well. But, uh, you know, who knows? We'll have to... that probably be a very, very long way off if it ever happens anyway. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to consider um, whether this was exactly the way that the Orokin unleashed the Tenno as well as being highly mobile strike forces. Because we know that they, they would add us into normal warrior groups like um as we saw in the i think it's the mag prime uh, codex entry and as we've we've seen in regards to um various comics and things which at some point i'll go through as well um you know we've seen all of that stuff where the tenno the warframes have been added to a squad of normal troopers but then here it's like you're you know the tenno by themselves are a highly mobile strike force and they have to go off and, and deal with whatever. And it's like, right, so how was this how was this a way for them to attack sentience? You know, was it the fact that they could use these ships to infiltrate sentience in terms of their serpent ships, their bodies almost, and attack them from the inside? Or was there something else? You know, what 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 was it that made this the better way to attack a situation? rather than turning around and dealing with it in terms of a proper cruiser or a larger ship. How is it that we we as Tenno were all put, in, or as operators, were put into stasis on the moon in the nurseries, and yet there is a somatic link on our the set or on our orbiter? Was that as a backup? Was that in case we it became necessary to, to spread us out? Um, was that a different design? Was that an override for someone else to come in and interfere with the warframe stored on our ship instead, and, and to cut us off from them in case things got too bad? Is that how the stalker is, is dealing with the situation? Who knows? I don't think that's how the stalker is dealing with the situation personally, but, you know, who knows? Um, Neptune. The corpus have perfectly uh, have perfected automated manufacturing and continue to demonstrate maximum efficiency producing the robotic proxies they build to serve them immaculate production uh, lines and flawless technical engineering ensure that the production of robotics and 
intelligent synthetic machines continues in perpetuity. Now, the one thing that stands out to me here is uh, about the fact that they they perfected it and it's it's flawless technical engineering to continue to re just just produce these intelligent synthetic machines, and that seems to be there seems to be an element there of what the Orokin did, but the the Corpus seem to be succeeding at it much, much more readily. Is that because they have been more careful, that they've learned from this, the mistakes of those that came before them or whatever else? Who knows? It, but it's interesting to take note of whether or not the, the Corpus are actually succeeding where the Orokin failed, considering that the Corpus themselves hold the Orokin up in such high esteem. Right, Lotus. Now I've got a lot to say on Lotus, so I'll, I'll read this and then probably go off on a tangent. But Lotus, the guiding light of the newly awakened Tenno, the Lotus is a mysterious companion and mentor who works from an unknown remote location that we now know. Uh, her past is rich with storied history and her knowledge of the known universe, past and present, rivals even the most studious Cephalon intelligence. Her reach is far, her allies are many, but her ultimate intentions are of dubious propriety. Now, for the longest time, even before we knew that Natar was a sentient, before something happened that put her together with Margulis in some way to create Lotus, um, I was sat there going, I don't trust Lotus. Turns out I was right not to. But also, I have a few things to pick out here. So... Yeah, fine. She's a, she, I'll give her that she's a guiding light to us because she wakes up and starts telling us what to do. That's fine. Um, companion, I wouldn't say so much because she she's not like as much as she wants to be a mother figure. She's got a long way to go to achieve that. As much as I would, I'm quite happy to call Rebecca space mom in terms of just because she's the done such a great job as the community manager, community director. I think. Of, of for DE and she she's very involved with her job and the community and what she's doing. Lotus, no, 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 no. I disagree there. Mentor, also no, because a mentor actually kind of drives us to do more stuff. A lot of the time, and and will will give us information. A lot of the time, Lotus has actually held back information from us that would be so valuable and so much more useful if she just told us. Um, we know her remote location now. It was on the moon, which again raises some very interesting questions considering she's Ascension and the moon was in the void for the longest time. So that's all very interesting. Um, her past is rich and, rich and storied, which we never come across any of. That lotus symbol that's on her helmet is everywhere. It's even marked on our ship. And it, seem, it was seemingly... Lotus, the lotus, was seemingly... Um, Margulis's favourite flower. So there seems to be an awful lot of that involved. Ballas seems to be the one that was mostly responsible for putting the Warframes together, for putting uh, other things together, in which case, is it was it him putting that symbol everywhere out of kind of honouring Margulis's memory because he actually cared, you know, he actually cared and loved her and whatever else. As much as he chastises himself for it later. But then she, her, her, her knowledge of the known universe, past and present, rivals even the most studious Cephalon intelligence. Well, fine, but what, she keeps getting surprised by things. She keeps getting scared by things. She keeps cutting on off kind of connection with us. And she doesn't tell us a damn thing. If she knows all of this stuff, she should have told us already. But like, like this, this, to me, is a case of going... There's a lot around Lotus that, that she, she could very easily be everything that they're telling us here. But we're not seeing it in game. She's not acting that way. And I, I'd still, like, I don't, at least Teshin, when we found out that he was essentially a traitor, it was very straight up, up front with us. And it was just like, I can't control it. I'm literally controlled by whoever holds that thing. You know, very straightforward, very, very simple. And... As a result, you know, it, it came out us being closer to Teshin. He's actually turned out to be more of a mentor to us because he told us the truth. He's let us know information. Um, you know, I wish that instead of him going, oh, well, it's not my place to tell you, 
about Lotus, Lotus should really tell you about herself. I wish he would drop that and just spill the beans. As, as many of the beans as he has. But uh, hey-ho. And this is this is kind of, you know, her reach is far and her allies are many. Again, we don't know about those those people, though, that are on the relays and things. So who knows? But her ultimate intentions are, dubi are of dubious propriety. Well, yeah, she needs to actually start owning up to her, her space kids if she wants to be space mom. That's that's the thing that sticks with me. And she seems to be trying because she actually sent us the, the somatic signal. Go away, fo false lotus. She sent us the somatic signal in the apostasy to let us know that Ballas was back and that she was essentially being kidnapped. So she started doing what I want her to. But she's like, I still don't trust her. She's got a long way to go before I actually get to that point personally. Um, like I, I personally trust my syndicate leaders more than I trust Lotus at the moment, even though Lotus has been with us right since the very beginning. You know, trust is earned. But anyway, uh, Lua, gold rings circle uh, and encapsulate the des desolate moonscape. Lavish architecture signifying the Orokin mastery over all things natural and technological during their reign. The opalescent halls stitching together what the enemy destroyed have been vacated since the era uh, came to an end. So seemingly the, uh, the, the damage that we see across the moon in various places is not entirely due to the shifting in and out of the void. Seemingly some of those large crevasses and, and damaged places and things like that were as a result of the enemy, which we can assume to be the enemy of the Orokin, i.e. the sentience. So, you know, we've got some interesting stuff there suggesting that the moon was attacked directly. But, you know, we'll have to see whether or not more of that history comes up. Because also there's no evidence of sentience, sentient corpses and things on the moon like the only sentient that we're really aware of being on the moon was Natar and yet Natar and Margulis have done some weird stuff that's melded them together to be Lotus in some way which that needs explaining so you know there's, there's that the Warframes the true nature of the Warframes and their Tenno connection is a secret lost to the old war kind of Together, they represent our best uh, hope in the tide in turning the tide of the machine war. Warframes are unique from Dax and other infantry, uh, infantry uh, deploying dangerous and esoteric void energy and equipped with often mundane physical weapons. This is key to fighting an enemy that had turned our technology against us. Even though the sentients are still obscenely difficult to fight at times you know um like you, i would expect that even if they had the elemental resistances they still also have resistances to the other procs as well and that that throws me off a little considering that mundane weapons seem to be the way to beat them but hey ho but again the thing here that stands out is the the um we've got uh, an interesting thing that says that the secret of of the connection to the, between the warframes and their tenno was lost to the old war but then further on it says that they represent our best hope at turning the tide of the machine war and it's like okay so we thought the old war was just the war with the sentience right so then what's this what's this machine war Again, there seem to be a couple of things here that have been written very, very strangely um, and seem to mention things that, that haven't been totted up properly. And whether or not some of them are red herrings, whether or not some of them are, are here specifically to add to the mystery of the mystery box as well as elucidate and kind of illuminate things for us, who knows? But that's just, you know, it's a weird thing just to write there. Pluto. Pluto is a small, cold, and organic tissue. Uh, an organic tissue does not fare well in its extreme climate, but the merchant spacemen always seek opportunity for profit in regions where others dare not travel. 
robotic proxies act as security in the largely unmanned manufacturing facilities that operate in the area. So again, this one's fairly straightforward. Although the thing that stands again out, uh, kind of out to me again, is that with Nepu Neptune, it's another gas giant, or at least it used to be. And I, I think there are ground-based maps there, so it's it's an interesting kind of set of things there. But Pluto again, too far out, too cold, maybe too small to really be. Uh, cared about or noticed by the Orokin other than it's got a gravity well that we can stick a rail uh, next to. So, you know, there's some interesting stuff there. The infested. Infestation of a living nat natural organism and the transformation of its molecular structure happens much more rapidly than with large synthetic ships or machinery. Infested nanites quickly break down organic tissue and begin to evolve the existing specimen into a new organism with characteristics and functions ideal for survival and self-defense. In many cases, visible traces of the victim's original form are still visible in the new mutated form, a stark and horrif horrifying memorial. Now, we've got a few examples here um, of the, the more ancient variety of... Uh, of infested because a lot of them like the, the the leapers and runners and the um oh what are they called chargers they're still very obviously corpus crewmen and um and grenier soldiers and here we've got the two mower types as well sat there oh we've got a charger off to the side there who's who's got the weird well in fact that's not a great picture of of one of those but hey ho but we've got the the um, what is it the boiler the brood mother and then the ancient and now the ancient we know seemingly kind of followed on from a lorist a healer for an orican kind of um, modified healer cybernetic healer that was part of a, a twin connection in the case of the one that we read. But we know that a lorist had the weird length of arms and, and whatever else and that they had healing capacity. And so that's why we see the weird arm lengths and the weird kind of structure around the back of the um, around the back of the the ancient here. You know, we, we see that. But then we've got these other two. And part of me thinks from the way that they are like the the boiler there with its its big golden orokin esque kind of thing with its arc over the top of it there, I feel I, I that that spews out new infested grown whole, yeah. It throws out its little pods, the pods burst, and it's a completely fully grown, brand new um, infested. And there seems to be an awful lot of kind of gold and kind of orokin metallic pieces on there and i'm wondering if that's that used to be a gene mold an orokin gene mold the had the, the 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 biological structure around it the creature that it now is was whatever was inside and it's grown out to incorporate elements that it, it had already um, consumed from lorists because it's got the weird long arm but then also it's that's why it's got the capacity to spew out fully grown new infested because it's effectively a cloning tank that got taken over. In regards to the maggot, uh, the maggot spewing brood mother though, I've, I've gen, I've, there's part of me that's like, is this an Orokin era Grenier? You know, the the, I feel like the the juggernaut that we see is um, a Kubro that's been uh, been infested and grown out that way. But here I'm like, wouldn't it be considering that the the Grenier, especially Bayhek, call us maggots all the time? Wouldn't it be interesting if it's actually the an ancient Grenier that's been infested and been changed and grown out that then spews maggots as us? Those are those are my thoughts on what they could be. I'm, I'm you know, especially on the brood mother, I'm I'm less certain. But it'd be interesting to, to find out what they came from. Orokin derelicts. 
even the most culturally and technologically advanced civilization in history could not contain the menace of the infestation. After an unknown cataclysmic event propelled them from the void, Orokin vessels were left adrift, becoming uninhabited and overgrown. The tireless force of probing infested tendrils penetrate and dislodge the once majestic and opulent halls of these Orokin vessels. Now, first off, it says after an unknown cataclysmic event that, that propelled them from the void, could the man in the wall be in some way related? Maybe. We need more information on the man in the wall. But also, the next thing that stands out is that first line where it says that they couldn't contain the menace of the infestation. Yet, we know the technocyte, the nanite, nanovirus that, that's been, uh, or the nanite-based product that's been used to create the Warframes, was controllable. Because we see there are corrupted ancient healers. So they were controllable, directly controllable. We see that we've got Helminth on our ship, who is literally there for all of our biological functions. Water purification, air purification, growing of food, and, and, and kind of the development of, of other certain things that we need, probably fuel as well for the ship. You know, creation of some kind of hydrocarbon-based fuel, maybe. You know, there, there's an awful lot of things that they could do with the infestation, that they could control it. You know, Technocyte was another tool that they were very capable of controlling. And yet, at times, it seems to have just run away from them. Why? How? You know, we, we see um, uh, Sectaris Bilsa running away with her, her executor from... Um, from an infestation outbreak aboard a, a tower. And it's like, how did that occur? Why was the neural sentry not able to... Because we know that there were well, there was a neural sentry because it said that they were corrupted on board. How is it that, that was, the, the neural sentry wasn't able to take over more of, of the infested the same way that we see that it's taken over Corpus Crewman, infested, and... Um, and uh, Grenier soldiers when we go and visit the void you know or was it just the fact that because these ships have been spun out of the void that something had gone wrong with the with the neural century you know it it's weird and interesting and i i do enjoy the tile set for the oracan derelicts because i enjoy going through and kind of seeing the various parts of the ship and how the infestation has seemingly taken over and how it's how it interacts there differently from how we see it interacting on the corpus the infested corpus ships that we find around Eris. Um so I think we'll do one more, or maybe well, maybe we'll do up to Lephantis, and then we'll do these last ones. Fat no, this is just gonna be a longer video. We're gonna do all of them. Um The Collapse. On the heels of the Tenno. Uh, Tenno's victory against the sentients, the end of the old war, the golden structures of the Orican civilization collapsed. The absolute cause of this ruination is unknown, but speculation has pointed to natural disaster, political uprising, and universal warfare as potential agents of cataclysm. Archive details for this event have never been recovered. Now, I was thinking about this the other day. We know that the Tenno, or Warframes, however which way it ends up being, uh, lashed out at the Orican Emperors, killed uh, and, and a whole load of executors that weren't actually present there. The Emperors died. The seven uh, executors were seemingly in various different places. Some of them died straight off. Some of them were killed, like we see the Grenier uh, killing uh, Bilsa's executor. But then Ballas just disappeared and went off and did his own thing, seemingly. And um, it's it's interesting to to think that the whole civilization collapsed. And I've, I mentioned this before in a couple of videos, uh, but I, I wanted to come back to it here specifically because what if it's because only the executors and the Sectaris class could control everything? Like, we we see that in Genus class trying to capture Bilsa, take her, her genetic code and leave um, to kind of get on top of things on his own ship so that he can access 
all of the systems and get on on with whatever else needs doing. And he doesn't want to take Bilsa with him simply because he didn't want to be outranked. And so it, it's it's interesting to, to think that maybe the collapse happened just because all of the leaders were dead and no one could actually access the, the structures, the systems and everything else to make things work again. That would explain why the entire thing collapsed and why you had the Grenier doing their thing and succeeding and why the Corpus kind of ran scared for a while until they grew out into something more substantial and why all of these different other small populations kind of solidified and kind of did their own thing rather than the Empire being able to persist or adapt and change. If there was just this block because all the leaders were gone, no one could do anything. Maybe their, their ignorance and their, their complacency because they felt that they were so untouchable left them in a situation where there could be no succession because it was all locked down so thoroughly. Okay, Lephantis. Now, I don't... A fair number of you guys have fought this thing, so have I. It's a lot of fun, but at the same time, it's a really weird creature that seems to have just consumed so much of the different factions that it has these three heads that embody each one. So, um, functioning agents of the infestation appear in a variety of horrific forms. While some infested organisms take the relative shape and physical properties of a newly acquired host... Older entities have taken unique and transformative shapes of their own, adapting to their environment over time and absorbing new victims to feed their evolution. Now, if that's the case, I have one big question. What the hell was Lephantis adapting to? Three legs, a variety of tendrils, three weird heads, each with its own weird thing going on. What was it adapting to? What Or was it just because it was in that sterile, kind of infested, heavy environment that it was just like, we're just going to dual express whatever we can. You know, whatever whatever we get, we're just going to use. Um, you know, I've got questions about its form based on that. But again, this also potentially suggests how and why... Um, we see certain warframes that have been infested. Like, I think we've seen an infested Chroma, an infested Mesa, and maybe a couple of others. And it's like, if that infestation inside them has been allowed to run wild, or if, if the warframe, when given control of itself, as warframes were once people, seemingly, once the Tenno retracts itself from that warframe's mind... And it's allowed to run riot, run loose. Then it's interesting to think that it would align itself with the infestation because of of the the sympathy between what it has become and what or what it is inside underneath the the warframe's shell, and what the um, these ancient, powerful, highly adapted versions of certain creatures could provide. Eris. There are no longer any active military or research campaigns in the Eris region. It is overrun. Long evacuated corpus and grenier vessels drift aimlessly in orbit, slowly being devoured by the techno-organic parasite known as the infestation. What remains is a twisted graveyard of partially digested ships that are disfigured versions of their original forms, abandoned but not unoccupied. Now, we've got Jordus around um, Eris, and that's a functional ship with a ship's cephalon that has been overrun, taken control of, and all the rest of it. The thing that, que that I have as a question is, if you've got all these different ships, we can understand the Grenier not using cephalons, but the Corpus seem to use them at least sometimes, and the Orokin probably would have done certainly. And so... The, the question that I have is why is it that we see these infested ships that have been torn apart and whatever else and we've we've got crew members that are still just lying there that haven't been eaten what is it that allows the technocyte to change 
some but not all. What is it that uh, that that means that they can't fly these ships, but Jordus can rock it around as much as it likes? You know, there seems to be some inconsistency. And if we look back at Dark Sector, the Technocyte would turn everyone into these weird kind of animalistic zombie creatures of some sort with their various strengths and weaknesses. But the only reason that Hayden Tenno, after being infected with the Technocyte, comes out the other side as being a, a, a badass uh, in the, the Excalibur proto-armor, essentially, is he has a weird nervous condition that means he's allowed... He, he can have the technocyte affect him without him experiencing the negative pain and, and upset that it would otherwise cause a normal person's body so is that the case here is there some other stuff going on you know is it the the systems that are in place on these things you know there are lots of questions that i would have about this and how what the technocyte was in that first game and and the reused ideas that they've got in warframe now now that they're making the game that they want to make how much of it all adds up and what's the reasoning behind it you know the oricans seem to know because again our warframes have technocyte flesh in, uh, inside them they have infested flesh living inside them we have an infested part of our ship um and the the helminth says specifically that it doesn't fear anything other than us other than the void demons and so what what does that mean for the rest of the infested what does the infested what is the infested consumed that allows it to know more you know there's lots of stuff here that that creates a lot more questions that we're going to have to get to at some point now this is an interesting entry warframe technology a mysterious weaponized armor controlled solely by the Tenno. Through the Warframe, Tenno can cheat death, channel the forbidden void energies, and face scores of enemies without fatigue. Due to apparent resistances of their biometal exoskeletons, Warframes can be safely deployed to infestation outbreaks should they occur. In-depth information of the Warframe mandate is forbidden to all but the Seven. Now we learn a lot from this paragraph. First off, the again, it suggests that it's weaponized armor, which it kind of is, but also isn't. Um, because evidently we've got human beings that were infected with tex technocyte thrown into these, these warframes, sealed up. We see them acting by themselves. It's what we hear from the sacrifice trailer from Ballas. Uh, but again, we do kind of take control of it. It is, it is a form of armor, I suppose. We can cheat death because we're never actually there. Channel forbidden void energies. Why are they forbidden? Interesting question that we've never actually really been told why the void energies are forbidden by the Orokin. And why they're looked to get looked so looked on in such a negative way. Uh, and face en enemies with um, without fatigue, you know, that's that just seems to be because uh, of the way that the people that went into these suits were specifically designed and then infected and pushed to their limits and whatever else uh, and then it says due to the apparent resistances of their biometal exoskeletons which again seem to potentially have been grown and kind of provoked into creation by um, the orokin using the technocyte infected people to poke them until it grew the, the metal exoskeleton grew over them um, warframes can be safely deployed to infestation outbreaks should they occur and again it's probably because you know we, we can go there we're, we're immune to it because as much as the flesh that we're wearing is infested the mind that's controlling it isn't and the mind that's controlling it is far away so you know infested tissue doesn't infest other infested tissue that would be counterproductive and so we're not going to get infested by infested tissue unless we give over to it, unless we willfully give over to it. And whilst there's a Tenno in control of the Warframe, it's not going to happen. But then the interesting thing here is this last line, which says, in-depth information of the Warframe mandate is forbidden to all but the Seven. So only the executors and possibly the emperors, possibly the next tier above, but I doubt they care very much, but only the Seven 
have full access to the information on what warframes are, where they come from, how they operate, how they work, and so on. Which is why everyone else assumes that we're just this thing in a suit. And it's only more recently that we've seen certain characters be aware of the fact that we aren't. And again, the queens realise that we aren't just this silent, mute thing in a suit. Because their father was one of the seven. We don't know which one, but we know that that, that was the case. So they were aware of what we were, probably through their their father. But other than that, like even most of the other Grenier don't know um, and haven't been told necessarily. But, you know, it's it's interesting to think that, again, that information was, was kept as, as quiet as possible and restricted as possible. And again, it's... Forbidden to all but the Seven, and I guess the Archimedians working underneath the Seven that were actually operating and developing the Warframes and things. Infestation. The infestation, infestation spreads across the Origin system. A techno-organic parasite that attaches itself to natural and synthetic forms, slowly digesting the host subject and transforming it on a molecular level. Organic materials morph into new homogenous organisms, while harder inorganic materials like metals will change structurally into a pseudo-organic substance that holds the characteristics of its previous form. So this is interesting because it goes that organic materials will morph into something new, whilst metals and things like that will be digested and broken down but then bound together in this kind of grey goo sort of technocyte nanite based viral thing um, and as a result it's like steel would still be hard it would still be um, kind of uh, conductive in terms of, of electricity and, and stuff like that but it's it's doing that through this kind of weird gooey semi-organic and they're not using organic in terms of organic chemistry where it's just containing carbon they're doing it in terms of biological material so it's this semi-biological mass now that still retains all of those other features and that's interesting i, I love this piece of concept art because it, that that there is a grenier galleon there's the front and there's the kind of ring that goes off one, that, that goes off the sides of it um but again we don't see an infested galleon really looking like that and it's a shame because that that looks kind of cool and terrifying to me but uh, hey sedna if there are new discoveries to make or ancient tools of war yet to be excavated the grenier want to be there first at the front of space exploration always seeking the upper hand against their foe they have numerous deployments that border the known reaches of our solar system, poised to enter brave new territory and unexplored space on command. Whoops. Nope, that was the wrong one. Um, so these, so the Grenier have set up on the very edge of the solar system to kind of, as soon as they find something that suggests that there's something further out, that there's an Orokin facility, that there's something sentient out there that you know whatever else they want to be out there and they want to be dealing with it first this is why we see more um grenier on der derelicts and things like that because they want to be there first they're going there to try and get as much as they can so they can weaponize it use it solve their their conditions in regards to their biology and stuff like that and sedna is their their far distant main base to do that and then with this last one Unlike the Corpus, the Grenier are not celebrated for their ingenuity and craftsmanship. Their notoriety is steeped in violence and military proficiency. However, the Grenier have proven quite inventive and capable of developing their own technologies throughout history. Hiding beneath scraps, uh, metal, uh, scrap metal plates, fading paint and recycled components are qualified devices used for research, manufacturing and warfare. So they're not completely hopeless. And you would think not, considering that some of the the Grenier leadership at the very least seem to be or seem to have once been um Orokin of one sort or another like the queens uh so 
you know we've we've got some interesting stuff there guys but the one thing I just want to do before I call it quits is I just want to actually just double check on where Europa is nope where's Europa see now Europa here it's it's like Earth and, and Lua or Mars and Phobos like they seem more I mean I suppose it's the only thing that links to Europa but it just seems like that little bit too far away because this this one is about Phobos and Mars are about the same distance apart as as these over here but it's it's that perspective I guess but uh, I don't know I, I always felt the that Europa was maybe more kind of off by itself like Ceres and Sedna and Pluto and Eris and stuff are but I don't know it could it could very well be and still be in orbit but hey ho anyway guys I'm gonna call it quits uh here on this one let me know your thoughts on the various pieces of law here um next time i want to go through the planes of eidolon stuff uh the 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 uh the thousand year fish and the gara fragments and things like that first um because then i want to go and start speculating about the unum and some other things based on those those bits and pieces there and i wanted to go through um, all of the codex, the basic codex stuff first, just so that we're all on the same page. We've all got a lot of information. I've thrown out some extra information just to give you some something to think about before we start getting into more speculative and, and interesting stuff where I'm going to be doing specific videos going and taking a look at very some very specific things, including going out and doing some stuff like I did before where I'll go out, do an excursion, edit in some stuff and whatever else. And as said, I will be doing a video on Auden Karras's um, own story, his individual kind of arc that we learn about through the hidden messages in the fragments. I'll be doing the same for other things as well. But either way, guys, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the video tomorrow. Take care. Thank you very much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video, then please drop us a like, share this video, and subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the video tomorrow. Take care.